Yeah. Good evening. Thank you very much for inviting me here. I'm not a master storyteller. I'm a storyteller. <laughs> okay. Uh, before storytelling, I think I would like to tell that what excites me is about stories, storytelling, and being a storyteller. And I'll try to stitch it all together to the most important topic, which I love talking about, is patriarchy. Before being a storyteller, I think many, many years before that, I started as a collector of stories, listening to people, asking them questions, listening to their stories. Because I feel that from generation to generation, we pass on the stories. And these are the lived experiences of us, what we enjoy, what culturally is accepted, what is not accepted. If you listen carefully, there's also telling us that stories also have the guardrails. They say, what, well, how do you have to behave in a specific situation? How, what is accepted by the society? What is not accepted? So fairly stories travel and they are from one generation to the other passed on. And they hold the cultural nuances of the family traditions and all of them. So I think many years back, when I first uh, looked at writing a story, I think I went back and thought, what is that subject that's interesting or exciting for me? And the one subject which I always struggled with, probably as a child and later on as a woman, has been about patriarchy in, in the society I belong to and the family system I belong to. And I felt that patriarchy is something which has been there for many years and will continue to be there for many years because we foster it you know, with a lot of love and affection. We hold it and, uh, and we ignore it also. That's something which is, I thought, okay, let me take that as a subject and work through my storytelling. So most of the stories that I write are about women who have been there before me and who will come in after me talking about what's relevant to them in the context of patriarchy. The need for men to control daughters, uncannily sanctioned by women, the compulsive urge to preserve the social order, the man's need for supremacy, and the woman's need for acceptance. This is what more or less it sums up to. You know. The social order that we want to preserve, the social structures and institutions that we have created, and uh, the reason why we do that, and uh, the reason why we do uh, follow a social order, is probably to always secure the most powerful ones, you know, the ones who are powerful. And uh, why do women do that to other women? It's primarily because to seek protection, probably, to uh, seek peace. And probably these are the elements that is what leads to us protecting a social order. And most of my stories across the last 100 years in India, most of my stories are in, entrenched in India. So. They are all about what is, what is it like for a woman to live in India in the last hundred years? And what will it continue to be if we don't change? The social institutions that I, try, I talk about and write about is about family, marriage, remarriage, divorce, widowhood. How do we treat all of this you know, from, from the societies we are part of? and the family circles we are part of, the family system or the social system we belong to, how do they treat these elements, you know? And how do we work with it? Sometimes I have come across people uh, saying that we have moved past this, okay? But when I was writing my book and the stories, I did a lot of research trying to understand in the tier two, tier three cities and in the conservative and the most or contemporary family structures, what, does, what actually happens, you know? And that's the very interesting part, you know, which I loved. When someone is telling a story, and when they're narrating an incident, I think what we have to look at is what is not said, what is being missed. I think most of the research that I went in to understand is what has gone unnoticed in the family systems. And uh, specifically in each of in the later style, the slides I'll talk about it. I think what, what was very exciting and interesting for me is uh, to see how the younger generation, the generation of today, and particularly how the society or the people living in metros react to these elements. They talk as if 
this is something in uh, 1930s happening and it's not happening today because it's not in my bubble, you know. I live in my air bubble and that's my bubble and, and that bubble is taken care of. This sort of underbelly doesn't exist, you know. That's where my stories come from, this underbelly of the society, you know. The society you and I are part of and then we sanction most of it. So when I was doing research, something which bubbled up very fast for me and which was surprising is how women envy other women. In a social order, when in, particularly in patriarchy, men actually make women do that work, you know, to ensure that no woman crosses the line. They, 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 no one strays. They are part of the social order. And if someone ever strays and goes beyond and looks for a moonshot, I think they are very quickly labeled. The splitting and projecting happens very fast. When I say projecting or splitting, it is like we call good and bad. We translate it to the next level, you know. The, we talk about the pious, the immoral, the sinner, or the saint. All of these names are given and labels are attached. And most of the time, women try to live by the order primarily because they don't want those labels to be hanging on to them. So, I feel envy was something which was surprising when I talked about women that have achieved something in their life, in the family systems they belong to, when I went and started asking questions and trying to understand unexpected places I found envy and it came largely from other women. I felt that probably in patriarchy, men actually ask women to do the dirty work of ensuring other women stays within that space. So I also looked at stories uh, from 1930 or 1920 where young women were, uh, I mean most of the time they were children, they were married off to older women, uh, men and I tried exploring those stories to understand how did the family process that information. Were they excited, were they happy, were they sad, how did they process that uh, story. Uh, and, and I was talking to the great grandchildren of that person and many, many such people trying to understand how did they process. And very surprising, you know, the young generation of today or the ones who are well educated and have achieved something in their life actually rejected those stories or told me that it used to happen in those days. But it happened in those days and, it, and also they used to add this thing saying that it is very common. In those days it is common. In those days it was common. But in today's when you are articulating to me, you can take a stand and say it is not okay. I am sure she must have suffered. It would, so most of the time my stories looked at the unnoticed, unacknowledged sadness and sacrifices women have made. And they are not soft stories, don't worry about them. But the stories that no one wants to listen wait and understand. We take them for granted. It happens in a very different format in the modern nuclear families when we discount the work a mother does or a mother who's working and she's still continuing to manage. What, do, what, what happens to that woman? Our expectation that that woman has to also do, do a phenomenal uh, housewife. I think that's the where it uh, bugs me. I think most of my stories talk about not very uh, the class divide, you know, in class in uh, families where the income is probably less than a lakh. If the woman is working, what is the expectation? What happens if you are extremely extra rich? What happens in those families? In what shape and size is does patriarchy play in our life? And our biases play in our life. The stories that we have heard from our grandmother and mother, and we think that is the custom and the belief. Okay. The, the places where I was talking to a lot of, particularly this came, this denial came largely from spaces where I was working a lot about widowhood and remarriage. And I talked that to families where uh, asking people who came from certain uh, places, asking them what happens in their cultures, in their customs, when if a woman loses her husband, do they remove the marriage markers? They said, no, nothing like that happens. It was all in olden days. Now nothing like that happens. But in reality, all of that happens. If we, all the people to whom I spoke had extreme good details about what happens in a marriage. The happy, clappy, celebratory stuff. But the murky, the underbelly and those ambiguous things around widowhood and what happened to the woman after that is something people are not even willing to acknowledge. 
and most of our view is about metros or probably if you're living in Bangalore, my life is around what happens in the society I belong to. That's what I most of the time call the bubble, you know. And my worry about the bubble is I'll come to the last slide, you know. I, I was writing about domestic violence and molestation and I tried to reach to families where domestic violence was part of those families, you know. They were, and what, uh, what was surprising is all of them acted against the victim. What do we do when we hear about domestic violence? Do we justify it by saying she deserves it or we, we don't react to it by saying they both are adults, they'll figure it out? Or something darker, we work against the victim, actually um, threatening the victim to ensure that the victim doesn't go to the court. The worst, the most difficult thing that happened when I spoke to domestic violence um, victims was the way families rejected them by not even acknowledging that what was happening or neither calling them to say, I am there for you. Telling them, I'm there for you, or we are there for you, not even willing to make that call and have a conversation about it. You know, that what cut the confidence of the victim. To pick up your pieces in life and move forward, it's the most difficult part, you know. And it makes it very, very difficult when you speak to a group of people who have actually gone through abuse of any form. So when I look back, when we talk about patriarchy, many times it's associated with women, but also young men also suffer from this whole social order that we have put out there. So it is so entrenched in that we don't even realize it, but the, when young men become adults, they actually do what exactly what the forefathers or the fathers have done, you know. They assume that that's the way of life and that's the way you win this through, you know. So for me, the question always, uh, through my stories, I looked at, saying, will the women in my stories, my aspiration is, can they look at possibilities beyond what is there, what is given by the society as a social order? Can they look at million other possibilities, you know? Can they look at new beginnings? And, can, and probably it's my aspiration of wanting them to do something different and not fall into the same uh, bracket which has been given to them to fall into. So this is where I come to. The, this is an audience I think is very privileged. And when usually when someone says that I'm privileged, and when I was young, I used to rebel against it, saying that I have achieved all of this because of my hard work and all of that. That's all aside, we are all privileged. We have access for resources unimaginable. So what do we do with this uh, privilege? So all of us need not start an NGO, but can we acknowledge when something is not happening right in the family systems and the social systems we belong to, can we go beyond the bubble that we sit in? I guess the moment you step out of the bubbles we are in, I know there is an underbelly and it's going to stink. It's not going to be beautiful. And we will always have our mobiles distracting us. Okay? And there will always be those urgent things. And there will be the families we belong to. And, and, we, and also the deception that I have to be this described nice bahu or a good daughter and a great mother, all these definitions are there. Okay? But I always wondered if ever, if ever Sita and Savitri had given one more chance to live, will they choose the same destinies or will they choose something different? Will Sita stay back, not going to the forest, wanting to rule the country? I mean, she was, she was capable. Will Savitri fight for that one man's life or look for her destiny somewhere else? Okay. So those are the questions I always have. And those are the same questions I'm leaving this audience with, saying that for the privileges that we have, can we rewrite the possi and work on the possibilities that are ahead of us? Can we step out of our comfort zones and look at those that are being affected? In conversations at the dining table, in the hall, where we are part of, can we look at all of those uh, biases and address them and call them out. Okay? It has to start from us. And it, as parents, we influence a lot. But as students, I think my, most of the time I'm talking to students here, my hope is that they will look for new possibilities. Thank you.
Thank you, Sunita, for that empowering speech.